Jesus and we're not to talk about America. Well, so a lot of churches in, in right now in our, in our culture today, they have adopted that. And I'll, I'll be sensitive for a moment and I'll say, you know what, I, I understand that, but I, I respectfully disagree with what they're saying. And, and I want to tell you why. First of all, God talks about and he uses the word the nations, all peoples, tribes, tongues, everybody. So God talks about all countries. We're one of those nations, right? We're one. But the second reason that I respectfully disagree with pastors and churches who do not want to talk about America is really somewhat of a, of a personal thing for me. It really is. I mean, while, while, I, while I agree that, that God does care about all the nations of the world, he loves the whole world, it's God's desire that everyone would be saved, no one would be lost, right? That's, and, and America has, has done a great job of sending missionaries around the world to do that. So, so I, would, I would agree with that. And even now, we are represented here this morning in Cottonwood by people from, from other nations, and, and that's wonderful. But there's something very personal, something very personal about, about this nation. And I, I illustrate it by saying this. You know, I, I care about a lot of things. Um, I've given my life to try to nurture and help families. That's part of my pastoral ministry that I've done for these years. But I pray more earnestly for my family, for Vicki and Jen and Josh and Ella and Jack and Jess and Jeff and Case and Lila. I, I pray more earnestly for them. You know, I, I, care, I care about a lot of churches, but I care more deeply about Cottonwood because I'm here. I, I care about a lot of nations. I have, I have the joy of traveling to different countries. And fell in love with the Ugandan people. And fell in love with people in, in Russia and up in, in Siberia. So I, I, I pray for all the nations and pray that they would come to know Jesus. But I pray more earnestly for the nation that God has blessed me to live in to work in, to serve in, hopefully to make a difference. I love my country. I love my country. Even with all of its faults and even with all of its flaws, all of its weaknesses. And I, I tell you, I, I want my grandkids, my four grandkids, I want my grandkids to love this country. I want, I want my grandkids to know about the great sacrifice that so many people have made for the land in which we live in. I want them to know about the freedom that they can have because people pay the price for that freedom. I want our kids to know that they can go to school, and they can get a good education, and they can succeed in life, and they can be free to live. I want my grandkids to unashamedly love America and unapologetically love Jesus. That's, that's why I want to talk about America today. So with your Bibles open, Psalm chapter 33, I'm really tempted because really the whole chapter what, what this chapter is, just so you'll know, uh, this, is, this is actually a, a praise chapter, praising God for certain things. <coughs> so let me just read it. You, you stay seated because it is rather long. When I come to the middle verses, I will emphasize some things really strongly, and I want you to pay close attention so you'll have a good idea 
where I'm going to go. I'm not going to preach a long time today. Of course, I've said that before, right? You, so you don't believe a word that I just said. So the psalm goes like this. Sing joyfully to the Lord. Did you do that this morning? You righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. So there's the thing. Now we know the thing. It's, it's good to praise him. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Amen? Amen. Isn't that a good word? He's faithful in everything he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. In other words, he spoke it. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth. Didn't just say the United States of America did. Didn't just say another country. Said let. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Respect him. We talked about that last week. A word of all. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Now watch this. Watch what happens here. The Lord foils the plans of the nation. That word plans is actually a word for wisdom. The Lord foils the wisdom of a nation. You're, we're going to see why in just a second. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart, now watch this, through all generations. God cares about generations. That's why I think it's we have a great responsibility to do everything we can to pass the gospel down, to pass uh, the Declaration of Independence, to pass it down to generation to generation, because we are forgetting it. We are forgetting it. I mean, I read the Declaration of Independence for a reason this morning. I haven't read it probably since high school or college. Now watch this, verse 12. Here's the key. This is even a part of Martha's song today. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Did you see that? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So let me look up here just a second. Let me ask you this. So would it be fair? Would it be fair to say a nation that did not have the Lord as their God takes itself out of a position to be blessed? Would you say that? Would you agree? And I'm not trying to twist scripture, but blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that word Lord is the word Jehovah. Jehovah. Lord God Almighty. There's no question who that is. That's not, that's not Muhammad. That's not Islamic. That's not anything. It's not Hindu. It is the Lord Jehovah God. The people he chose for his inheritance. Verse 13. From heaven the Lord looks down. I like it. God looks down on us. And he sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches. He watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all. Who considers everything they do. I mean God's watching us right now. He's seeing everything that you do. Now this verse 16 and follow. Really flows with what he just said in verse 12. He said no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. We might say scud missiles, tanks, or vain hope for deliverance, despite all this great strength that cannot save us. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. So where should our hope be according to that? I'll have to start all over. Our hope should be in tanks and missiles, right? In horses. In who? There you go. Why? Verse 19, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope. 
Don't you hear people say, oh, I just hope, I hope, I hope. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Verse 22 is the most interesting verse in this whole chapter because everything else has been in the third person pronoun and all of a sudden it's in the first person pronoun. It's as if I'm sitting here talking to Lonnie and Lonnie and I are having a heart-to-heart -heart discussion. It's not me saying, Lonnie, well, those people out there, it's now all of a sudden I'm talking to you and you're talking to me. Look what he says in verse 20, 22. So now he says, oh, may your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord. So he's talking to God. Very personal there. And then he says, even as we, all of us, put our hope in you. It's the only verse that's written in that tense. Now, I, I want to I just spend a little bit of time today thinking about the blessing. We like blessings. We spent eight weeks you know, with the Beatitudes, the blessings. We like blessings. But I want to talk about the blessing of God on our nation. You've probably heard of the Vanderbilt family. Cornelius Vanderbilt was one of the richest men alive in the 1800s. Um, if you watched the College World Series, you saw the university that he sunk the money into this past week, Vanderbilt University. He, uh, he invested in shipping, and, uh, but he really made his fortune in the railroad industry. And when he died, his estimated wealth was, and this is the 1800s, his estimated wealth was over $100 million. If you were to calculate that to today's money, that would be about two point five billion dollars. Pretty nice chunk of change, right? But what's fascinating is that forty. If I listen to this, forty-eight years, because I'm going somewhere with this, forty-eight years after his death, one of his, one of his own close descendants and relatives died penniless. How can that be? In fact, in 1970, there was a Vanderbilt family reunion held in New York City. 120 descendants, direct descendants of Cornelius Vanderbilt gathered. And there wasn't one single millionaire among them. Now you would think, if you had a hundred million dollars in the 1800s, and that was compounded daily, monthly, yearly, that out of all those years, that somebody out of that clan in 1970 would be wealthy, right? That would only make sense. You know, CNN, and I'm not a fan of CNN, but they, they, they reported a few years ago that those who gave away their wealth to their children, 60% of those children will die without any of that. 60%. And those that, that do, those that still have it, 90% of their wealth would be gone by the time the grandchildren come on out. Now that's just two generations. Think about that. How, how could that be? How could that be? I think we can agree that one of the main reasons why that can happen is because the next generation and the next generation don't always appreciate what they've been given, what they've been handed. And, and before long, two to three generations will not have what that generation had. Now, we're not talking today about, about financial inheritance, but we're talking about another inheritance that we've received and that I fear that we could be losing, and that's the inheritance of national blessing from God. Rolling Stone Magazine polled its readers on this question a number of years ago. Quote, is there anything that would motivate you to die for your country? 40% of their readers 
said absolutely not. Most young people, most, not all, most young people are uninformed or uninterested in America's unique spiritual heritage and have little concept of what of the price that was paid, the way that our nation was founded. We've slipped a long way from the founding fathers' willingness to pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor for the freedom that we experience all the way to today, where now the burning of an American flag doesn't even shock us anymore. Or a high-paid athlete to turn their back during the flag. We're, we're becoming the frog in the kettle. You know how you kill a frog? You put him in a kettle in cool water and you just barely turn up the heat and it becomes comfortable. And eventually it's really hot and dies. Now think about that, church. When you first saw Colin Kaepernick kneel during the national anthem, you were furious. A few years later, why come? First time we saw people burning American flags coming back from Vietnam, you were ready to fight. Now, I'm just, I'm just warning you that a nation whose God is the Lord will be blessed. And we have been blessed. But the nation that pushes God away and turns their back on God, they take themselves out of a position to be blessed. And what I'm trying to show you now is, you and I, I mean, we, we, can, we can get upset at the younger generation for the way they treat the flag or the way they have become uninformed about America, about the, the, the way America was founded, about the faith of our fathers. But we can't, we can't point fingers at them if we're not doing our part. That's why we, we have to step up to the plate. We have to pass the baton down. We have to teach. We, we have to show. Now, no doubt, as I read this passage, clearly, 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 I would never want to take scripture out of context, but clearly, God is referring to the nation of Israel here, right? No doubt about it, because that's who the nation was. But this message, and this text has incredible application for all of us. In fact, as I read a few moments ago, I think it's in verse 8, he uses the word all the earth. Again, in verse 8, he says all the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 14, again, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. So God cares about all the nations. In Job chapter 12, verse 23, God reminds us that he is sovereign over the work of every nation. Quote, Job 12, 23, he makes nations great. He destroys them. He enlarges them, and he leads them away. And we are one of those nations that God has made great, and we have been entrusted with a great, great blessing. So the three things that I'm going to teach you really quickly this morning are simply, simply this. So the, the blessing of God on our nation, first of all, the source, the source of that blessing it ought to be obvious, the source of that blessing. You're probably not sitting here today thinking, well, I wonder who the source of the blessing of our nation is. But as each generation goes by, it, it, be, it becomes less and less obvious. We see right here in Scripture, the source of the national blessing is, is revealed in verse 12, plain and clear. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We have been blessed as a nation. Amen? Amen. Would you agree? And we can be sure that God is the source of our blessings that we enjoy. Yes. 
God is the source. He is the source. Now, I, I could say a lot in here, but I, I want to I move on and I want to give you some examples because I think we find ourselves today. See, you all said amen to that. That God is the source of blessings. But we live in a time today in our culture, listen to secular radio, media, from liberals that could care less if we're reading today, that could care less about our flag. And you could hear them, and, and our kids are being fed this in the school systems, because that's where you always start when you want to teach. You start at the university level. Anybody ever in here ever been to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, any of the universities of higher education up in the Northeast? Every one of those schools, every one of them has a cornerstone. I stood at Princeton University where we planted a church one time, and the verse says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was the cornerstone of that university. And what is it today? They, I had a friend that went and got a PhD at Princeton in theology. Because, first of all, he's brilliant. And so he could handle the, the work. But he knew that if he got his PhD at Princeton, it would actually open up doors for him to talk to people in the liberal world. But catch this. His main professor at the Princeton Divinity School was an atheist. The guy that taught about God didn't believe in God. Now that school was founded on biblical principles. Harvard was founded upon biblical principles. So we've got to remember, we, we need to remember these things. I want to share some examples with you about our, our forefathers, about the, those who signed the Declaration of Independence. John Quincy Adams, his sixth president, he said the highest glory of the American Revolution was this, not all these signs, was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principle of civil government with the principles of Christianity. The early American statement, Senator, Senator Daniel Webster, you know about Daniel Webster, said, more than all, a government and a country were to commence with very first foundations. Those foundations laid under the divine light of the Christian religion. Let us not forget that the religious character of our, of our origin. First President George Washington, he wasn't shy about his Christianity. And in his general order, he called for worship services during every Sunday of the Revolutionary War. And this is what he said. To the distinguished character of a patriot, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of a Christian. That's what he thought about. And then possibly the most revered president of all, Abraham Lincoln, said this. Without the assistance of the divine being, God, who attended him, I cannot succeed with that assurance that he's with me. I cannot fail. Let us all pray that the God of our fathers may not forsake us now. Dwight Eisenhower, we went to his childhood home in Nebraska a couple years ago, or Kansas, I think it was Kansas. And he said, without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being, God, is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Now, I ask you, can you imagine hearing that tonight on the 10 o'clock news, or reading that, that people are saying things like that? They don't say this. They don't talk about this anymore. We don't hear it. It's silent. Now, we still talk about it in our churches. We still sing about it as we did this morning. But I fear at times there is now, and this is the key point today, I believe that there is a disconnect between the source of the blessing and all of our forefathers talked about who the source of the blessing was. It was God, the protection of our land, God. They were unashamed to talk about God. I'm afraid today there is a, there is a disconnect between the source of the blessing and America's expectation of the blessing. 
We just think it's automatic. And unfortunately, we live in a day and time where people are becoming lazy because they believe that the government, and this is not why there is a government, that the government will just send them money once or twice and maybe every month and we don't have to work, we don't have to sacrifice, we don't have to go out and pay the price like others did. What a shame that that's happening in our great land today. I'll get off of that and move on. But I want to give you an example of how I think that we have disconnected the source, God, from the blessing. I don't know if you remember this, but back in, in 2004, there was a, a great debate about the Pledge of Allegiance. And there was a group, it's always small, it's a small group, but the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So a small group said that children should not be made to say under God. And they wanted to take it out. They wanted to take it out. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And you, you, may, you may remember that the Supreme Court unanimously, overwhelmingly voted that under God should be left in the pledge. Well, as Christians, we all celebrated rah, rah, yay, yay. But the one thing that you didn't hear a lot about was the consenting <coughs> words of Sandra Day O'Connor, who was a Supreme Court judge at that time. Listen to what she said. She said, the phrase under God is in no sense a prayer nor an, an, an endorsement of religion. Reciting the pledge or listening to others recite it is a patriotic exercise. It is not a religious one. Do you hear what she said? Do you hear what she said? She said that everybody ought to be made to, to say under God because it, it really doesn't mean anything. It's just a patriotic tradition. So when you said that this morning, under God, was that because you're supposed to? Or was it because you believe that our nation is one under God? It can be a little, little frightening. There is a disconnect from the God who blesses and this high expectation that everything's going to be given to us and we're going to be blessed. Oh, I've got to move on. The second thing, though, I want to talk about the counterfeit sources of blessing. Because this is very interesting in this passage of Scripture. So, so keep your Bibles open here to Psalm 33. I want to, I want to point a couple of, a couple of things out to you this morning. Because the writer here lists some things that, that if you're not careful, you might miss, and I tried to emphasize when I read it, but how easily it would be for us to begin in, in our great country to say, you know what, we've done a, we've done a great job. Right? Our army, you know, we're the, we've got the strongest military, we're the wisest, we've got the greatest universities, and, and he speaks to that. He speaks to that. Look, look what it says when I, I, I emphasize it, and I even stopped and talked about it for a moment, but verse 10, one of the first things is, is, is one of those false sources of blessing is that we believe that because we're so wise, we're filled with wisdom. So the Lord foils the wisdom of nations. We believe, many people believe, because we are the most highly educated group of people, that's why we live in the greatest land, wisdom. But let's think about that. We do have a lot of wisdom. And we seem to have more knowledge and more wisdom today than any other time. I mean, how many of us already this morning probably picked up our phone or our tablet and we've Googled to find something? I mean, we have availability to wisdom at the wazoo. But really, is our nation better off today than it was 100, 200, 245 years ago when this was signed, the Declaration of Independence? No way. There's no wisdom. Wisdom is not what gives us the blessing. And wisdom's good. God gives us wisdom. 
The second thing is leadership, government. Look at the second part of verse 10. He thwarts the purposes of the people. He's talking about the leadership. I, I'm almost afraid to say this, but I'm going to say it. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that we have the blessing of God because we choose the right principle, even though I think we have a responsibility as a Christian to vote for a person that we believe that would represent Judeo-Christian values. But if you look over the past 50 years in America, we've had Democrats, we've had Republicans, and we're not any, we're not any better off. I'm not saying that there's not people that haven't done good things. But what I am saying is the blessing of God is not because of a Republican or a Democrat. The third thing, look at verse 16, and I emphasize this, no army is saved by the size of his army, no king is saved by the size of his army, no warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance despite all this great strength it cannot save. There are some that believe that we're a blessed nation because we have the strongest military. And I'm great. I mean, none of us today worried at all coming into this building. We didn't think anybody was going to check our name off the list like I told you last week that happened to me in Siberia and Russia. They knew that I had gone to church that day. I just, I just want to make sure that we don't think or we get to that point where we pat ourselves on the back and we say, you know, the blessings of our nation is because we're smart, because we have the best leaders, or because we have the strongest army. Anybody in here ever been to the Wall of China, the Great Wall of China? Anybody ever, you know, you've seen pictures of it. You know, the Great Wall of China was supposed to become the, uh, the most powerful form of keeping any opposing nation to come into China and to defeat them. And did you know that the first 100 years after the wall of China, China was built, that they were invaded on three different occasions without ever removing a brick? You know how they did it? They bribed the gatekeeper. And that's how nations got in to win certain wars against China. Think about it. Our greatest threat in, in America is not radical groups from the Middle East. Our greatest threat in America are United States citizens who pat themselves on the back and say, look what we've done. We don't need God, and we walk away. That's the greatest threat we have in our country because we have been blessed and the source of our blessing is God. And we say, I don't need God anymore because look what we've done is the greatest threat that our nation faces. Finally this morning, so what do we do? What's the pathway? How do we walk in that direction of, of God's blessing? Well, I, I think this is, this is really good because I shared with you at the beginning that this whole song, this whole chapter is, is a it's a it's a praise and it's a prayer. It's a prayer to God for his goodness and his faithfulness. So I just want to point out a couple things in the text that will show you. The first thing we're to praise the Lord for is verse 4. And I emphasize it when I read it. For the word of the Lord is right and true. God is faithful in all he does. Dear friends, if you want America to be great, you begin, you begin, you begin to praise God for his goodness, his faithfulness, his justice. His mercy, His kindness upon our nation. Where you began to think about God. Second thing, not only do we thank Him for who He is, but next we thank Him for what He has done. Verse, verse 5, the Lord loves righteous justice. The earth is full of His unfailing love. By the, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. I mean, everything around us, everything we see, God made. So, so we praise Him for who he is, then we begin to praise him for what he's done. Do you daily, church, do you sit down, do you say, God, thank you for this food. 
God, thank you for my home. Thank you for my transportation. Thank you that I have clothes to wear today. Thank you that I have clean water. Thank you that I have electricity. Thank you that I have power. Thank you that I have a toilet in my house. Thank you that I have the ability to pay my bills. Do you thank God for the things that you have? Or do you believe that you've done it? You see, that's the danger. That's the danger when we begin to pat ourselves on the back. So, not only do we praise God for who he is, we praise God for what he's given us. Then in verse 10, the Lord folds the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purpose of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord, or the wisdom of the Lord, stands firm forever. The purpose of his, of his heart through all generations. So, we praise God for the wisdom that he's given us. We praise him. We are wise because of what he's done for us. And I'm moving through these, obviously, rather quickly. And then I, I, I look at here, and let, 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 me just, let me just wrap this up. Because verse 22 really is a verse that grabbed me in my, in my studies in the writing of this, of this sermon. Because then, this is when it gets really personal. Oh God, I mean, this is us talking to God. This is eyeball to eyeball with God. And you know you can do that, right? You know it's okay to talk to God. You know it's okay to tell God what's going on in your world. You know that God already knows everything that's going on in your world. And so, being transparent with God, learning to pray where you just really talk to Him. And if, and if you're new in this praying thing, I, I get that, I understand it. But I want, to, I want you to know today that when you pray, you're just you're talking to God. You're talking to God. And if you don't know these and thous and a lot of big words, that's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Just talk to God. Just talk to Him. And so that's what the psalmist did. He says, oh God, verse 22, may your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So this Abraham Lincoln's secretary of the military during the heat of the Civil War came into his, his office and he said, Mr. Preston, I just want you to know that you don't have to worry about anything because God is on our side. And Abraham Lincoln said, you know, that's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about it. We are on God's side. That's what I leave with today. I can already tell you God's on your side. But are you on God's side? Oh, you can answer that. I want you to pray with me this morning. This 4th of July. July 4th, 1776, and here we said 245 years later, getting close to the 250th anniversary. This great land, you know, we really can make America great again. And I know that slogan is definitely been used a lot, but we will make America great again when we trust God. When we put our hope in God. That's what we need to do, dear friends. And that's no, I'm not saying that against President Trump. As you probably already figured out where I stand with him. But, I, but he's not my hope. He was not my hope. That's my hope. Put your hope right there. So why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. Ed and Susan are coming right now. We're just going to sing a little hymn of invitation this morning. Maybe God has spoken to your heart, gripped your heart about you moving away from the Lord. And it's time to come back home. It's time to come to God. He loves you. He cares about you. He's provided for you. He's blessed you. And sometimes we get real silly with him and we say, oh God, you know, why'd you do this? And blah, blah, blah. And God never moves. God never moves. God never moves away from you. We move away from God. And today it's time to come back to God. Put your hope in God. Put your faith in God. So Father, I pray in Jesus' 
name right now, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. God, you would, you would grip our lives today. You would be the one. Through your, through your Holy Spirit, you would draw us back to yourself today. Where we truly are a nation under God. Where we love you, where our hope is in you, where we believe in you. Where we're not ashamed to stand for the flag and we're not ashamed to kneel at the cross. Oh, how we need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And our hymn is...